And welcome back. Beginning in May, a new law will take effect, making it illegal for most New York employers to exclude pay ranges from their advertised jobs or promotion opportunities. Now, this will reveal what workers in one of the country's most expensive talent markets stand to earn and make it easier for New York-based job seekers to know where to start negotiating. What will that mean moving forward? And then also, we talk about new legislation through President Biden. What exactly does it mean for you? Joining us now to share more details is the founding partner of the Boyd Lloyd Group. We've got Patrick Boyd with us. And uh, Patrick, good to have you. Nice to be here again. Thank you. And uh, let's start off with national news first. President Biden uh, making a signing. And what does that mean, particularly in the area of law? Well, so uh, very interesting and important development. Uh, there's been a trend recently, which we've, we've talked about before, uh, as to uh, permitting more disclosure and transparency as to gender discrimination and sexual harassment. And a lot of employees in the past, when they start jobs, they're forced to sign a document that mandates that they arbitrate uh, sexual harassment claims, meaning they are deprived of a right to a judge or a jury trial for that matter. Uh, Biden's new law, uh, as of the third, uh, precludes that kind of prohibition. That is, if you have a sexual harassment case, you have an absolute right to a jury trial. You cannot be forced to arbitrate the, the case. Um, that helps for awareness of the discrimination issues that women have faced historically. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it helps uh, the public overall because more jury trials means more people having access to and understanding of these things that women have been enduring. Uh, so very, very interesting uh, development and a positive one. Uh, perhaps another interesting point to the law, which does not always happen with new law, it is retroactive. So it's not yeah. a prohibition saying employees can't sign it now and be forced to arbitrate, but rather it says, if you signed in the past, uh, that law or that requirement that you arbitrate is, is, is out the window. You now have that right to a jury trial, no matter what. Uh, very important change. And yeah, and when we talk about this, it's about 60 million Americans that are actually going to be affected by this. That's that's right. That's right. Uh, and um, an interesting point, which is a, a sort of narrow band of observation that I think is useful, is that the choice still exists. And I'll point it out this way. Uh, victims of sexual harassment uh, certainly have the right and opportunity to have a jury trial now, which is great. But some of them very much want these personal kinds of allegations kept quiet and private and still would like the opportunity to have arbitration. The employees aren't precluded from that either. That is, the new law just gives them that choice. They can choose to have the private arbitration if they so choose, and they also have the right to go to court. So it's, it's a win-win for, for employees, and, and I would argue in a democracy for everybody because there's more transparency and more ability to understand what's going on in our laws and in our country. Talk to me a little bit about what's going on also in the world of pay, because we talk about pay transparency here in New York City. Uh, and when we look at the laws, uh, there's going to be some changes when it comes to pay transparency. Knowing actually what a salary is and having negotiation power, that's something that's new as well. That's right. That's right. And I, th I think you said it best with that observation as to negotiation power. What this law uh, coming forth in my mom's birthday, May 15th, uh, now requires is that employers with job openings post not just the job, but the salary range of that job and to post that range in good faith. So uh, number one, as a prospective employee, you know walking into that job interview what kind of salary range you can expect, right? And interestingly enough, number two, if you're a current employee working somewhere and there's another you're being paid fairly because you can see that salary range being uh, offered to the new hire, right? Uh, the thought with this law, um, which is part of a trend, a couple of states have passed similar laws, is that this transparency will allow for uh, fairness and prohibit some of the institutional discrimination as to things like wages that were historically part of the process. Used to be people were shy about asking their colleague how much they were making. Now there's no issue with that. It's gonna be out there on the job advertisement all the time. And there's probably gonna be some meaningful leveling of salaries as a result, which is, which is a good thing for sure. Yeah, when we talk about this, though, let's look at where New York is. You've got New York uh, who is just on the beginning side of this because a lot of states have not yet adopted this policy. We know that uh, California and a couple of others are at the forefront, but we really uh, at the, are at the beginning of it compared to other states. Uh, th that's right. In, in, in a way that we were way behind on the whistleblower protections that we've talked about mm -hmm. before, we were ahead on this one when it comes to pay disclosure. And I think that's useful. Uh, one note, uh, as New Yorkers, I think it's important to, to consider is that um, 
this helps, but is not perfect in, in some ways when you start to think about jobs that have large bonus or commission components, right? What the disclosure requirements say is you're supposed to good, in good faith disclose pay. But if you're on Wall Street, for example, there's bonuses and, and, and added compensation that's not gonna be part of that disclosure. If you're perhaps a salaried or a commissioned person, that salary disclosure is not necessarily gonna be part of the posting at this point. So it, it helps, it's gonna impact a lot of people. I think it's gonna change the marketplace, but there are still a, a vast array of jobs that aren't necessarily gonna be impacted by this disclosure, particularly when you start to think about bonus jobs in Wall Street, which is at least a, an important component to, to the New York economy. When we look at what's happening right now, though, post COVID nineteen, well, I won't say post because we're still in it, but getting further and closer towards the end, we can see a lot of changes happening in the area of employment. We've got people who are working from home, right? You've got people now talking about unions. We've got the whistleblower policy, and so in a shorter matter of time, we've seen a lot of changes in the employment field. That, that's right. A, a lot of new legislation. And, and I think I think we would all say, or I don't want to speak for, for a, a lot of people would say, a lot of change in the mindset of employees as well, um, in terms of having had a chance with COVID to evaluate their priorities, evaluate their preferences, to consider how much they might or might not enjoy remote, remote work, how much they might or might not need to be in the office, and quite frankly, how much they might or might not enjoy their jobs, period, full stop. So the, the trend with, with union organizing to make collective rights stronger, the trend with salary negotiations being more powerful because of this pay disclosure law, the trend with whistleblower protections becoming stronger. I, I, think, I think employees, the, the pendulum is shifting and employees are gonna have a greater say in the way that they work and, uh, and function and hopefully in the way they enjoy their jobs. As we're getting close to the uh, end of the first quarter, we're moving into quarter number two. What can we anticipate to uh, look at on the docket as potential things that could be coming our way uh, that we should be looking out for? Well, there, there certainly are these trends to the legislation, uh, which we've talked about, but but I think the, the, the great unknown is probably the most important ingredient. On the one hand, we have uh, far more job openings than we have candidates at this point, which would seemingly influence and allow for employees to have more leverage. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I think we all know that, that COVID is still a question mark. And, and the war is having a meaningful influence on the economy and, and uh, the stock market and the optimism or lack thereof that people have. So I think there's going to be a push pull on that. And I, and I don't know uh, where we're ultimately gonna come out with, um, with a resolution. Uh, some employees may be very eager to just hunker down and make sure they have job security and not overly bargain at this point because they're concerned about the volatility of the world. Some employers may feel the same way about growth. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, if, if everything settles, uh, I think we have a recipe for great success and enjoyment, um, but there are, there are um, factors beyond our control, uh, perhaps, that are gonna weigh in on what, what happens next. Give me your assessment of the court system right now as we're coming uh, to this place where we're opening up a little bit more, we're seeing more activity. Uh, we hear a lot about bottlenecks and cases that are uh, have been hanging out there for years. What are you seeing? Are you seeing a little bit more movement? Are you seeing a little bit more traction? Uh, certainly more traction, uh, a little bit more efficiency as well. I think some of the judges and, and clerks have learned that they can have more court conferences by Zoom in an hour than they could in person. And so they're taking advantage of that and learning from that. Uh, there are absolutely cases that have been lingering on the dockets that have that have that uh, uh, are going to have to be cleared still. And so a bottleneck to be worked through at this point. Um, but, but overall, uh, with the court's there, there are some efficiency lessons that have been learned uh, that are very much um, going to hopefully change the process uh, to our benefit, and we'll get uh, faster, uh, more crisp decisions, more online filing opportunities, and those kind of things, which which ultimately help and uh, and get you know justice moving a little bit more quickly. <laughs> Yeah. Do we see more settlements? Because I know that that's one of the things that we're talking about, knowing that you're going to be in a place where this might take a few minutes. If a client is short on cash, we know that settlements are the way to go. Are we seeing more settlements? I, I think there, there's there's a combination of things going on. On the one hand, I think during the initial part of COVID, there were a lot of settlements based on that notion that, that the trajectory was long and hard for litigation. Um, now that the courts are back in in, in full capacity or close, I think that appetite for resolution 
uh, is not as strong as it, as it might once have been. So, so I would say slightly less as opposed to more as people are, are looking forward to perhaps their day in court, their argument in court, and their opportunity in court. One, one thing that, that, that I, I heard, a, heard a colleague mention that I thought was useful, or at least a, a powerful observation, is that sometimes the milling about in person in the court system leads to resolution. You see an attorney, you argue in front of the judge, and then you meet in the courthouse hallways or whatever, and talk a little bit more about your case and resolve the case. Um, that's not really returning as much still, Darren, because quite frankly, more people are still Zooming and not going into the court system. So some of those valuable conversations as to settlement are, are not happening just because people are not in person talking about their cases the way they once were. Um, so that's that's sort of a, a con to the to the new process, if you will. Well, a lot to say, pay attention to, Patrick. Thank you so much for being with us. Certainly, we will uh, have you back as we continue to discuss this and hash this out. Patrick Boyd from the Boyd Law Group. Now, for more information, uh, you can visit the website at theboydlawgroup.com and then also follow him on Facebook and Instagram at the Boyd Law Group. And so I want to let you know we've got more show. Don't go anywhere. Coming, We're coming up right after this. And uh, Patrick, again, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, as always. Take care. All righty, we'll be right back.